at the Medical College of Virginia, where he graduated magna cum laude. On to the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Dr. Shire completed a three-year certificate program in periodontics, earned a Master of Science degree, and received the prestigious John F. Pritchard Award for graduate research in 2001. He is currently a diplomate of the American Board of Periodontology and a highly sought instructor at the universities of Texas in both Houston and San Antonio. Primarily, Dr. Shire is actively involved in a very busy private practice in Houston, Texas, concentrating on all facets of periodontology, implant dentistry, clinical research, and ongoing publication. Presenting laser-assisted flapless crown lengthening pros and cons, please help me in a warm welcome for Dr. Todd Shire. Good morning, everybody. It's my honor to be here to present this topic to you, one that uh, we're still battling. Uh, it's a very controversial topic of laser-assisted flapless crown lengthening. I think we need to really understand some topics here. I can't, I don't have time to present them all, but we're going to talk about lasers, obviously. We're going to talk about crown lengthening techniques in, for specifically for smile enhancement. We need to understand biologic width and inflammation unanswered questions in the literature base. That's really the critical point of this presentation. A case series that we've done in a proposed randomized controlled clinical trial to further look at this. As we walk through these different topics, you'll see some clinical case presentation and some science that brings us to really what we need to consider as far as limitations and positive attributes of the laser. We know lasers, it's all about energy. We have a medium that produces this energy, and it basically moves on to ablate tissue, to vaporize tissue, whether it's soft tissue, bone, enamel, dentin. It ablates it and vaporizes it. The literature out there is limited as far as high evidence. Dr. Cobb did a very nice review in 2006 that looked at the limitations, mainly focusing on periodontitis. But within this same paper, he talked about what I'm going to talk to you about today, and that is unanswered questions that are out there. Is there sufficient tactile sensation transmitted through the laser tip to allow the condition to adequately distinguish between bone and root surface? Do the roots of the teeth incur any damage, charring, ditching? In cases requiring bone removal, does the lack of direct visualization allow the clinician to establish proper anatomical dimensions, contours, maintain papilla, the free gingival margin? In a case like this, where we really don't even have a restorative treatment plan, we're just trying to improve the aesthetics of this individual's natural dentition, we can have a positive and powerful outcome for a patient with no restorations at all. This is just a short little clip of utilizing flapless crown lengthening to help this individual. There is no doubt that the laser is a wonderful tool to ablate the soft tissues. But what you're seeing here is using this same Urbinium YAG laser to recontour bone. And you'll see this case a little bit later in more detail of how we go through both a flapless and flapped procedure to produce an aesthetic outcome that in this individual is quite powerful. But as a periodontist, someone that's used to removing the tissues to visualize the bone, you take a case like this and see the control we have over the osseous crest. Just like all of you restorative dentists have the control of finishing burrs and end cutting burrs to work on the bone, just like you do on the natural tooth. It's a wonderful thing to be able to see it, but obviously if we could avoid it, the patient would prefer that. You see the lingual here, the control of the osseous crest and the over-contoured restorations that we're gonna go in and refine at the time of surgery. This is well before this crown lengthening is done just to get the patient healthy so that they can be re-restored at a later date. And these slides are just to 
exemplify the control we have when we can visualize the crustal bone. In a case like this, once again, a case that, that begs aesthetic crown lengthening with no restorative treatment plan. Yes, maybe we could have a better outcome with restorations, but this, for this individual, she's absolutely ecstatic by our crown lengthening outcome. And it's because of the flapped approach here to really deal with that crustal bone, the buttressing bone in the posterior, as you see the buccal corridor, that bone thickness is four or five millimeters to the buckle of the teeth. How would one ever produce a favorable outcome with a closed flap approach? For this individual, with a flapped approach, we could not only deal with improving tooth lengths and symmetry, but get rid of the buttressing bone in the posterior, one which really has to have a flapped approach. I need to touch on the aesthetic elements of smile, but you all are the teachers of that, not me. I'm here just to say that it takes the perio restorative team to bring this all together, and it starts with a good comprehensive examination. We need to know about the crown lengthening guidelines, the golden proportions of teeth, the height width ratios, the axial inclination. It's critical that we have an understanding of all the elements of the smile not just the teeth, but the position of the teeth in relationship to the face, the position of the teeth in relationship to the lips, the position of the teeth, the position of the tissue around the teeth, the arrangement of the teeth, and the shape of the teeth. We look at classic literature on tooth dimensions and height of contours. This is critical to treatment planning for favorable aesthetic crown lengthening. There are many reasons why we do aesthetic crown lengthening. And these are listed here, from occlusal wear to erosion, inadequate clinical crown length for retention, recreating a healthy biologic width, dealing with excessive gingival displays and combinations of all of the above. But I really want to focus today on biology, because that's what this is about. It's about the biology of the patient, the understanding of it, how inflammation can hinder us, both before and after restorations, and really getting a gra grasp of biologic width. This slide just shows that we truly have an ability to influence biology. This is the opposite here, of course, where we have grown bone above a notch in the root surface on a previously fenestrated tooth. Growth factors are alive and well in periodontics today to be able to produce this. A denuded root surface, this isn't an intrabony defect. You're looking at avular bone de novo formation along the root surface, a fixed distance from the root that was previously denuded. So whether we grow it back or whether we resect it, it all comes down to understanding biology. This porcelain work is, is acceptable, I would say. But where it went underneath the tissue levels, tissue levels is unacceptable because there was no understanding of biologic width. There's classic articles from the 60s that we all refer to daily. But what's more important is understanding that these are means. We can't treat means. Every patient varies. If we look at the attachment apparatus, and we know that it's about one millimeter for the sulcus depth, the epithelial attachment, and the connective tissue attachment, but the ranges can be as low as 0.6 millimeters, and on the upper end, five millimeters. So what is your patient in your chair? What's their biologic width? And that's what we have to understand before we pick up a scalpel or a laser tip. So is biologic width a clinical reality? Yes, but it can vary greatly between patients. What we do in our office, as my mentors taught me, Dr. Pat Allen, Dr. Michael McGuire, Dr. Bill Robbins, who's in this audience here as a restorative dentist, taught my first lecture on aesthetic crown lengthening. We need to sit down and do that critical bone sounding from the, dis the distance from the free gingival margin to the sul and, and subtract the sulcus depth to come up with the individual's own biologic width, of course, in non-aflame tissues. So it's critical that we understand this before we start doing surgery on patients. Even if it wasn't done long in advance, we can do this chair side once the patient's under anesthetic. And we can solve this violation of biologic width by good basic biology. Aesthetic crown lengthening is certainly about the design and the biologic width and how we're gonna contour the bone and create space for the attachments. But biology certainly is the basis of what we're doing here. Understanding bone healing with lasers is critical. This is a resident case that we did, and 
basically we flapped it to treat disease and the laser was used to do bone recontouring on one side and a round burr on the other. Nothing more than evaluating healing and getting a better understanding of is there a difference in the soft tissue healing overlying this bone once it's treated with a burr or a laser. Back to lasers. This medium that's going to go out and target tissues is converted to heat, resulting in warming, coagulation, ablation, excision, incision through, taper, through tissue vaporization. We know that lasers are affected by many different things from the settings of the later laser itself, the tissue characteristics based on water content, uh, pigmentation, the density of that, and then certainly vascularity and inflammation is going to affect how this laser operates. We need to understand the different lasers. All lasers are not created equal. We need to understand the wavelengths, and certainly on this graphics we can see that, excuse me, that as we're focusing on the bone removal, these, this graphic over here to the left shows that the erbinium YAG and the CO2 lasers are much more selected for treating bone in, in soft tissues or water, the water content in soft tissues. So we need to use the right laser if we're talking about both hard and soft tissue removal. Some classic or some, some real more current literature on what the laser does to bone is helpful to understand that lasers can actually be a very positive thing when you compare it to uh, a burr. Here we see that the erbinium YAG created a very nice surface, fibrin-like and trapped tissue on the surface of the bone where the CO2 re resulted in some melting carbonized surface and the burr created a smear layer. So the erbinium YAG had more of a positive effect on the healing of the bone. Another study here shows that, that the calcium phosphate was not significantly changed between lased and unlased areas. So these things are showing that the erbinium YAG laser is a kind laser when it comes to bone. Yes, it ablates it, vaporizes it, but it does this in a kind manner. In another study, looking at uh, using erbinium lag, uh, YAG laser on the rat calvarium, seeing how this the erbinium YAG was better as far as new bone revascularization than the CO2 in the drills. Osseointegration, another fascinating topic in lasers today, is that when we utilize laser tips versus a burr to create osteotomy sites, the lasers actually produce more bone to implant contact at three weeks and three months compared to the controls. So this is, this is thought provoking stuff here on how lasers may improve bone healing when it comes to just healing of the bone or potentially even osseointegration. There's a whole bunch of advantages to using this type of laser uh, from the soft tissue and the hard tissue, ablation, uh, melanin pigmentation, gingival discolorations as far as amalgam tattoos and endodontic failures, contouring and cutting bone with minimal damage, possibly faster healing as you've seen from those initial studies. It affects bacteria. Uh, it, it will help remove plaque and calculus, stimulates fibroblasts through wound healing, granulation tissue removal, and certainly a lot of current literature today on the LNAP procedure. The pros I really see is it being minimally invasive. Maybe less surgical training, I'm not so sure about that. In my experience with a laser, it's taken me a very long time to really understand its potentials and its cons less pain and trauma from surgery, higher acceptance from patients is certainly a driving force on marketing your ability to treat a patient with a laser. All of these things together help us to understand both the pros and the cons. And the cons today are is there's just not enough evidence yet, folks. There's not long-term stability that's been documented in the literature. There are deleterious effects of the laser if used uh, even at the, in the best hands. We have to always consider the patient's best interests as we're treating them with any type of laser procedure. And it's uncertain today about the bony topography we leave behind that we don't verify if a flap is not reflected. So, a case series we 
published in 2011, really started working on this closer to 2005 and 2006, using an erbinium YAG laser to do flapless crown lengthening, but then reflecting a flap to see what we left behind. And this was indeed an eye-opener to us, and I think one of the main reasons I was asked to share this with you today. We treated nine patients. This was a pilot study. Five of them we were able to get back at three years. Remember, too, as I show a group of restorative dentists, that I am not the restorative dentist here. You will see restorations that you maybe don't think are outstanding, and I would agree with you. My point here is this is a pilot study, and it helps us look at things a little bit differently. We treated all types of biotypes. Case one here is a moderate biotype utilizing the laser for a initial gingivectomy, bone sounding, and then creating an osseous crest level that allows space for a healthy biologic width. In this case, we're also removing a little pyogenic granuloma on tooth number nine. And we're just walking through first crown lengthening and then flapping back and seeing evidence of very ragged bone and root charring. This is something that we're spending an, an incredible amount of time doing. I talked to Dr. Lesnay yesterday about the time it takes to do good laser crown lengthening, and it's not a profitable measure because it takes me three times as long to do it and do it well. And even when we try to do it as best we can, we still have results like this. As you see, the root charring uh, and then osseous recontouring in the bottom right slide of showing the final product of where we're leaving the osseous crest. The nice thing about this laser tip is that it's, it's built at three millimeters. So if you are using a closed flap approach and you're looking for that three millimeters of room between the free gingival margin and the osseous crest, that's our measurement tool. Seeing initial healing at one week and one month, satisfying result, but more importantly, where are we long term? Three months, it looks good. At three years, relatively stable with the exception of the pyogenic granuloma seems to be coming back. Another case, much more challenging because it's a thin periodontal biotype and we're not only trying to create gingival symmetry with these central incisors, we have to replace a couple congenitally missing lateral incisors. Limited crown lengthening to the right central incisor. We're pointing out here that the biotype is so thin that we can see our periodontal probe through that using our laser tip to do our vaporization of the soft tissues, using our bowl gauge to try to create an appropriate tooth link as compared to the contralateral central incisor. And once again, after hard and soft tissue removal, we're creating a flap, and lo and behold, in a thin periodontal biotype, we have osseous troughing. And again, we really spend a lot of time with a peekaboo pull of the gingival margin to try to get rid of that little ledging. But still, we weren't successful in doing so. So with a flap, we can come back and make our changes. Here's looking at the osseous trough of approximately one millimeter recontouring and leaving our self room for a biologic width. And here we are at three years post-op. We see some specks on my lens. I apologize for that. This is an old photo now, much longer than three years out. And a satisfy, satisfying aesthetic result, and in this case, very stable free gingival margin on the tooth treated with osseous crown lengthening. Now, a little bit further out at four years, a very happy patient and a nice outcome. Another tougher case with a thick periodontal biotype and a lot of wear, occlusal wear. See, this patient is not just going to be lengthened, but they will be restored. Using surgical guides, of course, is critical for the surgeon and restorative team to communicate and sisal edge length, proposed CEJ level. It really helps us with our landmarks as we go into surgery. I'll point out here a shortcoming of this case is that it appears to be planned that the two centrals are not going to be the same length, which is certainly an error 